Hey, God bless you. So great to have you here tonight. Thank you for being with us. If you're joining us online, thank you as well for being with us. Hey, if you're able to stand, we're going to take some time and prepare our hearts for what God has for us tonight. Thank you for being here. And you know, every time we come into this place, God meets us here. And every time we meet with him, he wants to speak into our hearts and into our lives. He wants to share his word and his heart with us. And that's what we're going to do tonight. And Father, we thank you tonight that, Lord, we are here and we're here with you. And you're in the midst of us. And Father, as you move amongst us, speak into our hearts and into our lives, Father. Touch every need in this place and minister to every need in this place. Lord, we thank you for what you'll do tonight. We thank you as your word is preached and as we worship. Father, every need will be met in this place. And God, we thank you for that tonight. In the powerful, mighty name of Jesus, amen. Good to have you tonight. Amen. You know, as we, uh, as we receive the Lord, we let Jesus be Lord of our lives. We need to be a visual for all of those that we come in contact with. And it's not just believers. Easy to witness to believers. Easy to let your love for Jesus show to believers. But let that show to those around you that don't know him. Have courage to step out and show them things that you are, what you believe, how you how you love. And after uh, early in the year of my life, my story, and then Easter, some of y'all in this room have heard my testimony. There's some rough spots in it. And uh, no, mom hadn't heard it, but she did now. So thank you, mom, for understanding. But then after a while, uh, there was a song that was released by Josh Baldwin that uh, Michaela picked up on. I told her I was going to throw her under the bus on this one. And she's like, I hear you. I hear this song. It's you. But you know, as, as uh, I was worshiping Monday night with Saved by Grace, um, we realized it's not just about me and my testimony or you and your testimony, but it's all of us. All of us need to let what you're going to hear in this song be very evident to everybody around us. So this is, a, uh, this is a new song for the church. It's a debut for here. Um, and I'm honored to be able to, uh, to bring this to you tonight. Amen.
us tonight, God, right where we're at, Lord, right where we're at, God. We don't have to be perfect. We don't have to be put together because you make us new and you give us new hearts. For in your presence, Lord, there's fullness of joy. In your presence, Lord, there's fullness of joy.
leave that up. This is the key to almost everything. Okay? This is it. This is why we, we just don't sing songs and get the songs over with. As Jesus said, and we believe what he said, that one day there'd be a people that worship in spirit and in truth. So his presence takes care of fear, rejection, weakness, bondage, insecurity. And, and when it, it fills this place, we want him to be exalted in our praise. But, but look at this, as we worship, we believe that he's near. We believe that he's near, not because we wait to feel something, but because his word guarantees it. We're people of his word and spirit. And his word says he inhabits the praises of his people. And there's just something after, there's just something about the macro group when we come in masses on Sundays it's the most favorite day of the week but there's something when you press through your calendar like like you did today to be here and we come in with enough of today on us and uh, we poke through the heavenlies and just lay hold of him through the day but when we get here and we worship him in spirit and truth his manifest presence comes because his word promise it will he inhabits the praises of his people and when that happens we worship we start believing that he's near so I just want you to put aside all the politics today I want you to put aside all the chatter I want you to put aside what didn't get accomplished. And I don't want you to be anxious for tomorrow. But right here, right now, his presence is here. And I don't want you to miss it. Yeah, I want you to feel his presence as a given, okay? But before that even happens, or need to happen, we have to know that his word promises that he's here. He's here because he inhabits the praises of his people. He's here because when two or three are gathered in his name, he's here. And to our friends home, got to talk to some of you yesterday, checked on you. He's with you as you worship. And our friends out of state, out of area, overseas, might be new to you, you join us in. That's why we put the words on the bottom of all the YouTube video services. You start worshiping him with us. And then wherever you are, you start sensing something in your heart. It is the, the third person of the Trinity. It's the Holy Spirit. It always glorifies Jesus. And it makes known to the Father what we have need of. And even now, your heart's being touched. And even now, here, church, we want him to be exalted in our praise. As we worship, our belief mechanism starts kicking in. And Father, right here, right now, in the name of Jesus, Father, I pray everyone right now just has a revelation of the truth that you are, as the Old Testament said, Yahweh or Jehovah Shema, the Lord God who is near. And Father, right here, right now, when Jesus came, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. We beheld his glory as he tabernacled among us. And right here, right now, I thank you for a joy unspeakable. I thank you that heaviness and 
concerns about tomorrow and unfinished business of today are falling away. I pray right now that there's a sense of your manifested love, the weighty glory of who you are in our midst becomes so real that as far as your heart concerns, when he's here, nothing else really matters. So we don't rush through this right now. We lay hold. The scripture speaks about laying hold of righteousness, laying hold of eternal life, laying hold of him. So why don't you just do that right now? We lay hold of you, Lord. Holy, 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 Lord God, almighty, the whole earth is filled with your glory because your glorious ones called by your name are worshiping you in spirit and in truth, even now. Come on, start worshiping him. Help me in spirit and truth because that's what Jesus said he desired to see one day. True worshipers. Oh, Father, right now you know those that are sick in body and disease and don't even know it. In the name of Jesus, because where you are, sickness, depression, addiction must leave. In the name of Jesus, you are here. You're the God who is our ever. You need help tonight? He is a God who is your ever-present need. He's your help. He's your ever-present help in this time. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Your manifested glory, Lord, rest upon your people. In the name of Jesus, right here, right now, right here, right now. Come on, come on, whatever you have to do. I'm, listen, Paul told Timothy, stir it up, stir it up. It was given to you. Lay hold of everything that was ever deposited to you. Paul said, I desire to come that I might impart unto you a spiritual gift. Listen, it's a time to lay hold of those prophetic words that the enemy says, you're disqualified. You don't deserve that. No, lay hold of eternal life. Lay hold of those promises. Lay hold of those prophetic words. Lay hold of his word in the name of Jesus. Brush off the residual warfare, the smoke of the elements and rudiments of this world. Oh God, right now, Lord, let your people sense your presence because in your presence, there's fullness, there's provision, there's peace, there's healing, there's courage. In the name of Jesus, right here, right now, healing, 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 Lord, healing. Healing in the name of Jesus. Deliverance. Deliverance of addictions and strongholds and fears. Deliverance, Lord, of the enemy who thinks he has legal authority in your people's life. Now listen, this is important. He only has authority where we give him ground. Paul was speaking to Christians, and I'm seeing this now, but I'm protecting your best interest. But I'm seeing it. The word of God penned through the apostle Paul said, give no ground to the enemy. Now I want you to positionally take the ground back. Take the ground back, verbalize it quietly. Take it back, take back the ground. Give no ground, the ground could be as little, which is profound enough as your lack of faith or giving up on your God's word. Take it back. Or the ground could be given into a familiar sin. And the enemy only has a measure of access to the ground that we give him. That's why Paul wrote to believers, to the church, give no ground to the enemy. Take it back through repentance, confession, repentance, and renouncing it. Sin will not have dominion in my life. Fear and doubt and rejection will have no place in my heart, in my mind. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, right here, right now. Come on, don't wait for the next thing to happen. 
God is happening now. The Holy Spirit is happening now. He's been working all day since this morning at the altar. In the name of Jesus, he's here. He's not the God who was. Yes, he is. He was and is and is to come, but he's the God of right now. In the name of Jesus. And some of you online, you need to lay hold of eternal life. Lay hold of it. You've heard. You've heard more than enough. He sent his word of healing and deliverance to you. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God is raising from the dead, you will be saved. Whoever calls upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ shall be saved. Invite him into your life. Say, Lord, I need your salvation. I put my faith and trust in you and what you did on the cross. I admit that I'm a sinner, but I also admit that you're my Savior. Save me, Lord. Come into my heart, Lord Jesus. Be Lord of my life and future. Right here, right now, and even as you're doing it, the Holy Spirit bears witness in your heart that you're a child of God. Therefore, there is now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. In the name of Jesus. I just sense the Holy Spirit is moving in here. And you need to lay hold of not some of you, you've already laid hold of eternal life. You need to lay hold of, of what God has for you now. He's your ever-present help now. In the name of Jesus, he will perfect that thing concerning you if you just give it to him and believe for it now. Believe for it now. As we worship, I believe you are near. As we worship, we believe that you're here, Lord. And he's where you are. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, all 24 time zones. No good thing does he withhold from those who walk uprightly to him. Not by your righteousness, by looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of your faith. In the name of Jesus. Why come to a building if he's not here? He brought you here. He's given the earnest of the deposit by the Holy Spirit in your life the moment you believe. He's got to stir it up. He's here. And because he's here through the person of the Holy Spirit, every spirit of fear has to leave and replace the power, love, and sound mind. No fear, no double mindedness, no doubts. I am persuaded, you're persuaded that he is able to do exceeding abundantly above more than we could ask or think according to his power not our power his power that worketh in us in the name of Jesus Jesus Lord God Almighty we humble ourselves in your sight Shake it off. Paul got to Malta. He was bringing wood to a fire so he could warm himself up and those that are with him. And a serpent bit him. He read it in Acts. And he had to shake it off. He's got to shake it off. Shake off things that easily beset you. And we praise him regardless of how we feel because it's like he inhabits, he visits. The word became flesh, John chapter 1, and dwelt among them. And when we worship him, that word, the Greek word, dwelt is tabernacle. He, he tabernacles with us. Divinity clashes with humanity. Is this revival? I don't know, but we're heading in the right direction. What he's done the last several weeks, what he's doing in your life, don't let it go. Don't let it go. Don't let it go. So many of you, most of you, raised your hands. Uh, when I 
had just gotten that water before anybody spoke anything. God started speaking to me, transformed my life. He touched me, he gave me assurance, whatever. 160 of you. From Wednesday to Wednesday and a Sunday in the middle. That's nothing yet. Ralph shared, I don't know if it was public or to me, he said the moment he put his toe in that water, whatever he said, said. <laughs> Listen, I, God, God, God is moving when we, 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 we just enter into his presence. When we stick a toe in the water. Or even when we drive into the parking lot. Could you come here quickly, Kate? Talk about God just showing up on somebody's life. Just quickly, just share. You drove onto the parking lot today and something happened. I woke up yesterday morning and with uh, something stuck in me, my, my, in my throat. Now, I, some of you know I study medicine and I'm very familiar with my body. So I said, this does not feel right. It's not a normal symptom of any kind. And, but that something stuck in my throat kind of also took away my appetite. And I said, oh, great, you know, I'm fasting. So now, perfect. And I said, okay, maybe tomorrow it will go away. I woke up this morning, not only something stuck in my throat, I woke up with such a heaviness. I was so heavy. Wednesday morning, every Wednesday morning, I go for yoga class and I do it with my friends. I really didn't want to go. My heaviness was so focused. I literally, I had many things I supposed to think of. I couldn't think of anything. But I say, you know what? I have to go to the yoga class because the girl's going to wait for me there. I don't want to disappoint her. I'm the one who brought, you know, brought her to do yoga with me. So I got myself to go there. But literally, if I was walking, I feel like I'm dragging my feet. I was dragging my car. I got there. I did my yoga. Afterwards, our routine was that I supposed to go have lunch with her. And I just say, you know, I'm fasting, so maybe think of a lunch place that I can eat, kind of. And she picked a restaurant which is close to her home. She lives pretty far in Lake Mary, so, and the yoga place is in Orange City. So as I was leaving the yoga place, I said, I'll meet you there. We drive there. And I, was, so I got to a point where I was supposed to get on to turn right. I will go on to I-4 towards Lake Mary. Turn left, I will come back to here. I just couldn't. I just picked up the phone, wasn't even thinking. And I just said, I'm so sorry. I can't meet you for lunch today. I have to go. So I drove here, drove to the parking lot. I pretty much know no one was going to be here, but I just wanted to be here. I drove into the parking lot. I was stopped right there by the front door, and my car was facing the door. And I just started to cry. It wasn't a cry, I would just start it to pour. Something some of you know, my story I want to share with you. I'm 54 years old. Growing up in China, actually even after, I, even after I came to this country, I would say until I was about 40 some years old, I couldn't cry. It's not because I didn't know how, I couldn't cry. When I was in China growing up, I was taught not to cry. I was taught this is life, so you deal with it. So when I was 12 years old, my parents took me to get my tonsil taken out and they wouldn't give me any medication whatsoever. When they took my tonsil out just like that, I screamed in pain, but I didn't cry. So I couldn't cry, but I cried. As I'm crying, I'm praying to God, I say, please God, I grew up without you. Please don't take that away from us, that the opportunity for your children to know you. I, grew, I had to grow up without knowing you. You were there for me, but I didn't know. I didn't have the opportunity to know you. So you know what, thinking back, I couldn't cry and I never really laughed either. I was never, I would live in the darkness. My days were dark. My heart was dark. That darkness was so heavy on me that I couldn't even cry. So I cried out to God today when I was in the parking lot. I just cried, God, I know that we need to be obedient to whatever your will be done. 
But please, God, I pray that there's so many people, there's so many people out there in other countries that they don't have the opportunity to know you. So don't take that away from us, from your children. Don't take it away from our brothers and sisters. Let us assemble. Let us come to your house. Let us worship. Please, God, don't take that away from me. And as I was crying, as I was praying, as I was just, just desperately seeking God for the Holy Spirit, I started to make sound that I don't even know what I was making. And it didn't come from here. Remember, I got something stuck here for two days. It came from deep. It's not even this deep, it's even deeper. And it just came out and it was nonstop and it kept coming and kept coming and kept coming. And I started to sing. Yeah. Now, I can sing, I used to sing, but this was not any way that I ever sang before. It was almost like a holler of some kind. But it was, I sang things that I don't even know what it was, but I just kept singing. It went on and on and on and on. So the Spirit, the Holy Spirit is here. And after that, it was just an amazing feeling. And then after that, I keep thinking, you know what? Maybe this could be a dark day. Maybe tomorrow could be even darker. Maybe we'll have a lot of dark moments. But one thing the pastor said is the light shines the brightest. And as I keep thinking on those words, the light shines the brightest, I actually realized that I spent almost 20 years researching environmental. And one of my main projects that I researched was how to stop fire to, from spreading. And I have an invention, how to stop fire from spreading. And what I learned from that is, Actually, the easiest way to stop it is not to create a barrier, is not to pour water on it. It's to take the source of that flame, which is the oxygen. So if you can take the oxygen away, the fire cannot exist. But the interesting thing that came to my mind today is all these years of me studying how to stop fire, what I'm realizing today is that there is a fire. Don't be discouraged if you don't see light yet, or if you are seeing darkness coming, there is a fire that's been ignited. The flame has been ignited. And we are that oxygen. God gave us that breath when we first come out. Well, we are the oxygen. Our breath, our words, our prayer is the oxygen for that fire. And this fire is going to spread. The blood of Jesus is going to cover not just this nation, but it's going to spread to my home country, spread out the world. So this is not the end, this is the beginning. Something has been ignited in the hearts of all his children. So don't be discouraged. The Holy Spirit is right here with all of us. And Almighty, I feel it. Sometimes when you have something so long, you forget what you have. It said that familiarity breeds contempt. He would never say that in regards to the things of God or the Holy Spirit. What we have, we'll be accountable for. But, but, but get this, he, he wants to give you more. He wants to give you more. He wants to do more. He wants to give you more, exceeding abundantly above more than you could ask or think. It's time for the church to start asking. It's time for the church to start seeking. It's time for the church to knock. It's time for the church to lay, lay aside the things that you can't fix in your life or your spouse's or your child's life. Let God arise and let his enemies be scattered. It's time to be with God, send his son to 
die on a cross to give the only hope of the world, and that's the church. And you're the church. The church was born, was, listen, was born in fire and must remain in fire. So, Father, right here, right now, I pray to everyone, everyone right now in the name of Jesus, the fire will burn in their heart. And they'll fan the flames. You know, as new, you're, you're a priest. Did you know that? You make up a royal priesthood, the scripture says. And the first responsibility of every priest is early in the morning. Is you blow on the ashes and you rekindle the fire from the night before. And the priest would do something else also. They would go down to the street lights, the axe had street lights then, with olive oil and a little myrrh, I think, in it. And they would light them when after dawn, after it got dark, about a half hour to an hour after dusk. And they would take the old robes, the old robes of the priests. They would be thrown away, and they'd be the wicks, not just a little wick. And know what they were called? Swaddling clothes. And two thousand years ago, with a little. A little, little Mideastern woman named Mary. She gave birth to deity, to the Son of God, and wrapped him in swaddling clothes. And he would blaze a trail for two millennia and hand over his legal power of attorney to every one of us that borrow his name, Christos, little Christ. We have to ask ourselves every morning as we rekindle and stoke the fire in our heart each morning as a New Testament priest, we have to decide whether we're willing to invite the Holy Spirit to set us on fire. I'm not talking about weirdness when you go into your job. I'm talking about the light so bright. People, people almost have to look away from you or they're drawn to you, but not to you to the one in you that gives them love, acceptance, hope, deliverance, and salvation. Spirit of the living God, don't depart from us. Now your presence fills this place. Be exalted in our praise as we worship. I believe you are near. It's good to see you tonight. Why don't, we, why don't you hold the song, the last song, and then let's do the offering and announcements. Okay. Heidi, do you have a word? That's the best word. Um, I think it was yesterday or Sunday. Um, I had kind of forgotten about this one necklace I had um, from one of our tents years ago, um, but it's a little kind of squiggly line of diamonds, and it, and it was... Um, our journey year that we had journey and I've always had that necklace that um, journey symbol on the same necklace together with my star of David and it reminds me of um, uh, this psalm and as we were worshiping with with this song it I God took me to this psalm 84 this morning um, when I was in my devotions he just started speaking some things and I ended up in psalm 84 and then as we were singing this, he brought it back again, and um, it has to do with that setting your heart on a pilgrimage to seek his presence and in, in his temple and in his tabernacle and being in, under the shelter of his wing. And um, it says, How lovely is your dwelling place, Lord Almighty. My soul yearns, even faints, for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. That's what Kate was doing today. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. Even the sparrows found a home, and the swallow a nest for herself, where she may have her young, a place near your altar. Lord Almighty, my King and my God, blessed are those who dwell in your house. They are ever praising you, always praising you in your presence and dwelling together in your house, God. Blessed are those whose strength is in you, whose hearts are set on a pilgrimage. God, we set our hearts, Lord. We set our hearts to seek your face, God. We set our hearts, God, on a pilgrimage to seek you, God. 
as they pass through the valley of Baca, that's the valley of weeping, that's hard times, they make it a place of springs. Lord, flow with living water, God. As we go through valleys of weeping, God, I ask that we would flow with your Holy Spirit as we seek you in your presence, God. The autumn rains also cover it with pools. They go from strength to strength, from glory to glory, till each appears before God in Zion. Hear my prayer, Lord God Almighty. Listen to me, O God of Jacob. Look on our shield, O God. Look with favor on your anointed one. That's you, Jesus. Better is one day in your courts and your presence than a thousand anywhere else. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of the wicked. For the Lord God is a sun and a shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor, and no good thing does he withhold from those whose walk is blameless. Lord Almighty, blessed is the one who trusts in you. So I thank you, God. We trust in you. We thank you, God, that you do cover us in your presence, God. I thank you that that those that, that dwell in you, those that set their hearts on a pilgrimage for you, God, will find strength, will go from strength to strength, God. And I thank you that you hide us in the cleft of the rock like Moses. You, you, put him in, you put him in that little cleft, God. And I saw that during worship, that little, tiny, little, tight spot. God, he was put in that tight little spot and you covered over him with your hand and your glory passed by. And he got to experience your presence in a way nobody else ever had. So God, I thank you that you hide us in the cleft of the rock. God, and that you reveal yourself progressively, God. As we continue to come to you, you continue to reveal yourself from strength to strength and from glory to glory. God, and you continue to, to show us more layers of those that every sin and every weight to cast off. Get that, that refining fire, God, you're skimming us off. You're refining us, God, with your fire, Holy Spirit. You're saying now, okay, now this one. Okay, now this one. Come closer. Come closer. Come closer. Come closer. Come up, my beloved. Lift your head. Lift your head. Look up. Come up. Come up. So we say, God, we set, we set our face on a pilgrimage, God, to your presence, Lord. And we say, yes, each thing that you bring up, everything, every time one of those things comes up in the refining, we say, yes, Lord. We say, yes, Lord. We say, yes to you, God. And I thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. We're going to change a few things. I have to just give you this word. Monday morning uh, is like my date for a, a future message. <laughs> sometimes I think it's going to be that week, right? And uh, sometimes it's not. But uh, you see Renee's running to do that body combat thing. And uh, so I got some time to uh, just get alone and hear the Lord speak. And uh, and it has everything to do with keeping the fire burning. And uh, it's going to determine the duration of the manifested presence of God in this particular congregation. Renee, throw me my sunglasses. My not sunglasses, my Dollar Tree glasses. And... Um, and so here's the word. Thank you, baby. Here's the word that the Lord gave me. Two words. He gave me two words. Monday. And uh, they brought. Whew, they brought. I couldn't get out of my head. They brought. And then I, I don't get spaced out sometimes, or I'm not getting old or anything. Don't worry, but people who know me a long time, I, the Lord like opens up the scriptures and over here, and, 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 I, and I read them. Pages go, and I read the scriptures. And, uh, and I, everywhere I saw, it started with Jesus when they, when they brought the paraplegic. They brought... And then the poor man that was sitting by the, the pools of Bethesda, that nobody would bring him to the water to get his miracle. You know, so, so Jesus came to him. They brought him Jesus, okay? 
Uh, they brought, they brought, I couldn't get him out of my head. They brought, and I felt the Spirit of the Lord say, yeah, I'm starting to do something. But the duration of my manifested presence is going to determine to the measure of the people fulfilling those two words. They brought, they brought Matthew 8, 16. That evening they brought to Jesus many who were oppressed by demons, and he cast out the spirits with a word and healed all who were sick. Oh, we want to see miracles, Pastor. We want to see miracles. Bring the people that are sick, diseased, addicted, that are broken. They brought. Then you have the miracle. Now, here's something very profound theologically and philosophically. You might want to take this down. It's very deep. You don't need a miracle until you need a miracle. You don't need a healing unless you're sick. They brought sick, and he healed them. They brought those that were bound by demons, and he cast them out by his word, and he healed them, and he healed all that were sick. And God says, this is not going to be a bless me club of springs, of revival. He wants so much more. He wants so much more. He, he, he Right, right, you know, in this area right here, we have this unseen well, prophetic well, spoken by people outside this country, in this country, our own intercessors. But back near the foyer, we had a, a, a Betsy Murray Pennington, they had cattle here, and they dug a hole and filled it with water. There was no spring to it, so it wasn't very pretty. Living water is beautiful, it's refreshing. I was going through some pictures. I forgot to show my wife the other day because she was doing a, uh, another type of destructive workout. And I had a picture of Baron, our, our purebred Siberian Husky with blue eyes. And we used to go hike the Appalachian Trail. We're the tri-state area of west, northwestern New Jersey. And no cement jungle there. Mountains, beautiful. And the Delaware River is head spring. And then PA and, and New York. And we would go with our friends and we would take our canteens and we would take Baron and we would go hike this in, in October when the leaves were, you could smell the, the photosynthesis, but the breakdown of the leaves that turn in different colors, you smell that fresh fragrance and, and there'd be water coming out of rocks and I'd bring my old military canteen and fill up that water, it would, it would be, make that canteen cold and drink it. I feel bad now to give them the military plastic, they're like plastic canteens, you know. Ugh. But, you know, we could either be a source of living water or some religious memorial of that stagnant, that stagnant pond that we had. And I think Tom Winslow would, and some of the other guys, uh, maybe John Anderson would stab the big frogs and get the frogs with them, you know, because frogs don't mind stagnant pond. We can't. And I'm not, I'm not telling you what you can do or can't do, but I know what God's telling me. In this move of God, it's not about me, it's about him. And, and he said, you pastor the move of God, but you can't control it, Mike. You know, so a lot of you are going to have to step up. I mean, baptizing people, discipling them, taking their phone numbers, checking on them. The reason why he gives the gifts, Ephesians 4, he gave some so they could bring. He gave them so they could bring. He gave some prophets apostles, evangelists, pastors, and teachers as a gift to the church. Sometimes we don't feel like a gift, and sometimes you don't treat us like a gift. It's okay. Listen, here's the reason why. To the, that five-fold ministry, it's not a five-fold discount. It's a five-fold ministry so that everybody could be perfected to the image of Christ and all of you to do the work of the ministry. That's the only way that a renewal or revival or an awakening of a land is sustained. Stoke in the fire, and freely as you receive, you freely give. They brought, they brought coal to be ignited. They brought their hearts to grow strangely warm, and they got to share it with somebody. They brought the light, moonbeams, if you would. They brought the light so people would know where to go when they're lost all around you. 
They'll follow your smile. They'll follow your heart. They brought, when it says in Matthew 14, 35, and when the men of that place recognized Jesus, they sent around to all the regions, and they brought to him all those that were sick. And I'm appealing to you. You don't want to bring people to a cemetery. I get it. You want to bring sick and lonely and and love sick people to a place where there's no love, where the place where there's, there's, there's no living water. But you will if you know that the manifest presence of God is in the tank, at the altar, and even in the parking lot, folks. They brought. They brought. You'll never be embarrassed if you bring somebody and somebody doesn't get their miracle. You'll never be embarrassed because they'll tell you, thank you, thank you, thank you. My life has changed because of you. And maybe they didn't get the miracle. Maybe they didn't get the, the cancer to completely leave. But I'll tell you something. Start bringing people and the cancer will leave. The blindness will leave. The afflictions will leave. The suicide will leave. The addictions will break off. The healing will come to those that have been abused. Your life will get straightened out. God will make us, bring us with gentle repentance, but real repentance to get rid of the junk in our life. So we don't grieve the Holy Spirit. Quench not the Holy Spirit. And then here in Matthew 17, I titled this, The Hopeless Start Bringing the Hopeless. See, they brought people start bringing. God's people, the early followers of, of Jesus, start bringing people. And then all of a sudden, the lost people start bringing people to Jesus. The hopeless, the hopeless will see what you're doing and the joy of it all. And they'll start bringing people. The hopeless will bring hopeless people. And when they came to the crowd, a man came up to him and kneeling before him, saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he has seizures, and he suffers terribly, for often he falls into the flame and often into the water. I brought him to your disciples. They could not heal him. And Jesus said and answered, and this is the reason why he's given us a window of time, to crucify the flesh, to come clean before him, and to de develop a faith in our hearts that allows us to make ourselves vulnerable and see the miraculous happen. Jesus said, oh, faithless and twisted generation. You know that term, twisted generation? You know what the problem is? You know what they mean in the structure of that, of that, uh, that verse in its in in his original language? It is a thought pattern of the world mixed with the thought pattern of God. Twisted, twisted generation. We have a generation of people that were brought up in the church that tasted the goodness of God. And because of life, because of the culture, because of education, because of a lot of things, it's a twisted and perverted generation. It's a twisting of the paganism and truth. It's a twisting of, of carnal knowledge and, and, and biblical truth. We have to come clean. So when people bring to you, and to me, people that are bound, we could bring deliverance to them. We could bring healing to them. They could bring them to the church, and they don't leave. Listen, they won't leave. Whether they get their miracle or not, whether it's a profound manifestation of the grace of God, they will get something from the Lord, and they will leave different than the way they came in. And that's where you start. That's where our faith grows, for the impossible become probable. And that Jesus, be, I love the, night, the nature part of him. Oh, how long am I going to be with you? Come on, you knuckleheads. Come on, you dirty dozen. Come on now. Come on. You know, you can make this happen. You've walked with me all this time. You can... You can do this, man. You know, you can do it. Oh, you faithless generation. How long am I going to bear with you? Well, he bore them 
all the way to the end, and he didn't lose any of them except for the son of perdition, and he bore them all the way to the cross where he bore their sins and mine, and he used imperfect people. Stop quali- The reason why you judge and qualify other people and their imperfections, why God uses them, because you doubt your own usability because of your own imperfections. You might want to write that down. God, God wants to use you. God wants to use all of us. All of us, with all of our undoneness, all of us, with all of our unpolished business in our life. I want pepperoni on my pizza, okay? And then Jesus rebuked the demon. And he came out of him. And the boy was healed instantly. You're going to be hearing testimonies next Monday and Tuesday. You heard one tonight. I try to get a testimony, if you notice, each service. Next Monday night, next Monday night, 630, make sure you eat before you get here. You're not going to eat later. We're not, we don't have all of our ducks in a row. We spent hours this morning trying to do logistics. You're going to see it. Good old, remember the cow trough days? Kathleen and and Ralph, I bought a, this young pastor, bought a cow trough. We're going to have baptism. He had a young guy's nuts. We have no baptism. They came that Sunday night, and we had a cow trough. We have two cow troughs, and we have that. And we're going to, we're going to, see, we're going to see God do stuff in your lives again. Jesus had to pray for a blind man more than once. We're too stinking religiously proud to give God a chance to bring his full deliverance for us to completely come clean or for us to go from healing to wholeness. God wants those of you to experience healing to go into wholeness. And those that are sick to move into healing. And if God in the flesh, the word that became flesh, had to heal, had to pray for someone more than once, so do we. Bring them. They brought them. And they said the disciples came to Jesus privately because, you know, they didn't want to be embarrassed. Yeah, Jesus, you know, like everybody's watching us, you know. We like being with you, and when you're doing the miracles, we sort of like act like we're doing them too, but how come it didn't work for us? Jesus privately, they came to Jesus privately, and, and that's what they said. Why couldn't we cast them out? And he says, because of your little faith. For truly I say to you, if you have faith like a grain of mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here. And it will move nothing. Listen, church. I prophetically speak from this day forward. Nothing will be impossible for you if you don't touch the glory. An old preacher told me when I was a young guy, there's three G's, young man. You've got to be careful. The three G's. Don't touch God's glory. Don't touch the girls. Don't touch the gold. I said, yes, sir. Don't touch his glory. Nothing will be impossible. And when you start seeing your hands, we had a Baptist minister come to our Friday night renewal part. Uh, renewal, it was like a party, a renewal services, and he wanted to disrupt the services. His, his wife came uh, on, on a Friday morning for prayer because Renee engrafted a, a, a woman's thing for pastors and wives and women from our church. And this, this pastor's wife, she just broke down. This Baptist pastor's wife in the city, the land, years ago. So I'm not saying anything from any local church. It wasn't the land church. But she came and broke and got delivered. And she says, I've just been tortured in the ministry. I can't live up to people's edu- expectations. I'm tired of it, but we can't quit. I just and, and she got loved on by some of you ladies, and she got filled with the Holy Spirit. And then she told her husband about it, and he got mad. She said, I'm coming back to that night. I'm coming back Friday night. That night. I'm coming back tonight, honey. You're going to go. And she came, and he came like this, and he was a big guy, and he was standing like this, and he was going to disrupt the service, but he didn't, of course. And then we had like 10, 12 pastors uh, stand shoulder to shoulder in the city. We honored each other, and there must have been 200 people in front of that church in that altar. And then a pastor works his way through and wanted to talk to me. Right in the middle, I'm giving the altar call. I'm positioning all the pastors. Remember, Pastor Carl, you were like right here. And, and, and he, I just said, come on, man. I, said, I, just, I turned him around, and, 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 and he wanted to prove something to me. When he lifted up his hand, like three people got slain in his spirit. He, stood, he stared at his hand. And guess what? Guess who became a believer? 
He did. He got excited for the next two hours. Okay? Just don't touch the glory. Nothing will be impossible to you if we don't touch the glory. If we don't use psych or power of suggestion. We keep our hearts pure. They brought people. You never have to defend God. Just bring people. Go receive something from the Lord. Now, I wrote a little scribble something here. I can hardly read my own writing. Beware. Bringing can bring unbelief. Bringing can bring unbelief. Mark 6, 5 and 6. Jesus could do, he's in his hometown now. He's on the circuit. Okay, okay, I'll visit my hometown. He went to his hometown, and this is the commentary that's kind of sad, and we don't want to happen here. Mark 6, 5 and 6. He could not do mighty work there except that he laid hands on a few sick people and healed them. That's God in the flesh. We've got to be careful, church. We've got to be careful. And Jesus marveled because of their unbelief. And he went about among the villages teaching. Bringing can bring unbelief if we're not careful. But they brought. This was the pattern that went through the Gospels. This was the pattern, the acts of the Holy Spirit. The book of Acts, I get a little bit upset. The religious tradition calls it the acts of the apostles. It was the acts of the Holy Spirit operating through apostles and about 120 other people and the den, then the Gentiles that they reached, right? It says in Acts 5, 12 through 16, now many signs and wonders were regularly done. Listen, were regularly done among the people by the hands of the apostle. It's a precursor to what was promised in Ephesians 4, 12 through 14, when God would, would use the, the apostles and prophets and evangelists and teachers to, to equip the, the people, the people, so the people could enjoy doing the miracles. So you could enjoy what it's like to sense the anointing of the Holy Spirit, and you give somebody who's an inch away from committing suicide, but they came in, you discerned it, you gave a word of knowledge, and you brought them to salvation. Or somebody else at the doctor said, you got three months to live, and you pray. By your hands, you pray for them. You brought, you brought them. You cared enough to bring. They stepped in the tank. They got a miracle. They got a testimony. They, they, they pulled into the parking lot. They got baptized in the Holy Spirit. Their toe hit the water, and they knew it was a move of God. It was amazing. They were all gathered together in Solomon's porch. Some of your translations say portico. None of the rest dared join them. Hmm. You got to get ready for that, too. But the people held them in high esteem, and more than ever, believers were added to the Lord. Multitudes of both men and women. This is important. Women. The gospel and the power of the Holy Spirit liberates ethnicities, genders, people groups. It gives everybody a chance to get into the game. Get into the war. To get into the blessings of the Lord. It says, so that even they carried out the sick people in the streets. That means the manifest presence of God packed out the place, and they just brought people near the place. That's basically what it would be in, in, in the common language. They brought the sick into the streets, and they laid them on cots and mats. That is, Peter came by, lest his shadow might fall on some of them. The people also gathered from the round towns around Jerusalem, bringing... They brought, folks, bringing the sick and the afflicted with unclean spirits. And they were all healed. Every day I see people in chaos. I see people love-starved. I see people fearful, weak. They look like they're 80 years old and they're 40. I see it. Yesterday at Aldi's, Aldi's, Indians, whatever they call it, Aldi's, I like the place. Right there, north side of town. You know, I don't carry. You know, my, you're, the young generation told me not to have cash. You know, God comes up, I want 85 cents. So I get a hamburger. 
I said, ah. Some of my kids told me how to not use cash. I don't have cash. I didn't have a quarter to get. I couldn't even get the cart. I can't get a cart at this store called Aldi. You've got to put a quarter in there. Are you kidding me? Credit card I can stick in there, but I, you know, I, got, I need a quarter. I'm shaking the thing. I don't have a quarter. So I told the guy, I don't have any change for it. All right. And so I went a hamburger. I said, wait. I had an extra bag of groceries. I, mean, I, I had my own little, little circuit on t- Tuesdays. I get a few bags of groceries, and I go. So I, do, I, I did this once before. It blew out the, another guy at another plaza. So he's got, the guy's getting mad at me. I said, okay, you want something? You, I'm going to give you something more than 85 cents. I pick up this bag of groceries, and if you've seen it, and you, some of you help, aren't they heavy? What do you say they are, Bill, about 35 pounds? I pick up this thing. He's on a bicycle. I go here. Boom. Boom. There you go. He goes, what am I going to do with that? I go, that's a that's hundred hamburgers there. There's, I don't, there's, uh, there's tuna fish. There's, there's Vienna sausages. I can't, I can't do anything with that. He's getting mad at me. I said, I can't win. I, I said, I, I, can't, I can't win, sir. I picked it up. I put it back in the truck, and I, I, I left him a blessing, and I left. No, on this travel, I love this. It says Paul, while he was waiting for them at Athens, the spirit was provoked with him, and he saw the city was full of idols. From here through the story of Mars Hill, we see Paul going into a place, maybe like a college town. I rather the land live up to its mandate of from 1882, faith, hope, and charity. But within a couple years after that, they start penning for tourism in the Northeast. Back in the, back in the last 20 years or the last century, or well, two centuries ago, they start calling it this, the, the Athens of Florida. Okay? Well, maybe there's a little facsimile, and there probably is if we admit it. But Paul was troubled. So you're going to bring people because you're, 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 you're provoked. You're, you're carrying a burden. You're clothing yourself for identificational repentance for the, the condition that people are in because they don't have to be in that condition. And you're going to have to learn how to carry and facilitate that burden and and turn it into a redemptive venue they brought. It might be more than you could handle, but you could bring him. You could bring him. Just bring the people. Just bring them to hope. If If you run out of hope for the day, bring them. Bring them Sunday. Bring them Wednesday. Bring them if they're men on Thursday night. Bring them. I guess the problem is we don't bring ourselves to them. We don't bring ourselves to people. It's kind of hard for us to bring them, isn't it? In Acts 17, 19 through 21, and they took him and they brought him to the Aeropocalypse, saying, May we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting. We're talking about Paul. For you bring, you bring. And this could be this could be the, this could be something that you got to handle and not get defensive over. For you bring some strange things to our ears. <laughs> some of you from other streams of Christianity have been coming here saying, "Oh, this is some strange stuff." <laughs> Nothing new. You're in good company. For you bring some strange things to our ears. We we wish to know, therefore, what these things mean. Now all the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there would spend their time in nothing except telling or hearing something new. Boy, doesn't that seem like America 2020? Doesn't that seem like the land, huh? Doesn't that seem like the people that are in the... Never mind. I don't even know who the President of the United States is anymore. Anybody know yet? I'm forget it. I'm going to go there. Then my last thing I'm going to leave with you is from Acts 19. Be prepared as you bring to not only bring all type of people, but when everybody's bringing somebody who needs the Lord, the place may not seem that comfortable to be. And I hope that doesn't make you feel uncomfortable. Because when everybody starts catching this and start inviting people or bringing people, the lame, people on beds, gurneys, and then the, the first thing that the enemy pops in your head, what about they don't get healed? 
Don't let that bother you. You'll never know until you bring them. Jesus' cry hasn't, hasn't stopped. He says, bring them. Come unto me, all you that labor. They're laboring, folks. They're laboring and getting very little return on their investment, on their jobs, if they have one, in our community. Can't you hear Jesus in the land of 2020, the last eight months? Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. The guy was telling me how tired he was. One of the last things I said, well, listen, if you're tired, you don't hear. I gave him some beautiful rolls. He said, I can't take them. I go, why? Because the raccoons will eat them. Bring them. Let God sort it out. Bring them and let the Holy Spirit sort them out. But you better be prepared to welcome them and love them and be patient with them. Especially when they're waiting for the miracle. Because they may not get the miracle, but they'll get the love. They'll be connected so they could have a lifestyle change, so they could hurt less. And there will be miracles, and there will be healings, and there will be recoveries, and there will be changed habits. Be prepared for the eunuchs. Be prepared for the Ethiopians. Be prepared for the Samaritans. Bring them. And when other people do, accept them and love them cast out demons and heal the sick. And all you got to tell them is that the kingdom of God is near you. That's all. That's what Jesus did when he sent the 72. In Luke chapter 10, some translations say 70. He sent them into the city. He said, connect with the people. Eat what they put before you. Go into their homes. Drink what they put before you. Heal the sick. And then just tell them, the kingdom of God is near you. They do it. They did it. He says, some will receive you. Some just shake the dust off your feet. It's not for you to worry about. And they went. And the rest of Luke 10 is really fun. They come back to Jesus all excited. The rank and file, the church peoples, 72. He said, Jesus, just like you said, we cast out demons. We healed the sick. You know what Jesus said? I know you did, because I saw Satan fall from heaven. In other words, the stronghold over that neighborhood, over that spirit of poverty, over that spirit of intellectualism without Jesus, without the word of God, Jesus said, I saw something break in the heavenlies. My kingdom came. My will was done. And then he brought everything into perspective, like Forrest Gump. I didn't mean to break your pardon. He says, if you're going to boast in anything, boast that your name. He said this to the 72. They're starting to feel good, and you should. If you're going to boast about anything, boast that your name's written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Because inevitably, folks, the fish and the loaves story has never ended. Fish and the loaves, bad knees, high blood pressure, addiction on drugs, addiction on legal you know, prescriptions, shot marriages, betrayal, unfaithfulness. It's, just, it's the fish and loaves. But you bring them so they can lay hold of eternal life. If you don't seem completely whole here, because of your love, because you brought them, you'll see them there someday. Could you imagine what that day is going to be like? Would you stand with me? The offering. 
Okay, the offering. Let's put the, for our friends online, let's put the picture up, okay? The offering. There you go. All you guys with the buckets, just stand by the door, okay? Do a teen challenge thing, you know, like in cross and switchblade, shake it, give, give, give. Yeah. Jesus. Isn't this better than watching the elections getting stomach knots? I was going to have some fun. I found a, I found a, a, a George Bush pin from the 1990s. I found it. I don't know how I found it. It was in my house. I was going to put it on tonight, you know, but I thought I would probably get in trouble, you know, the government or something. You see that? Oh, he's pushing a, you know, 20 years ago. But see, I said, I don't know where I got it from. George Bush pin, you know, put it in there. All right. Friends, God loves you so much. And you could thank God for COVID, because through it, you've tuned in. And Jesus has invited you to his marriage supper. And you'll die once, and that's it. That second later, you'll live forever. But until you take your last breath, you live with him. And he'll never leave you or forsake you. Just open your heart if you haven't already. Invite him in. And those that are here tonight, consecrate your life. Remember, both Moses and Joshua, what did he tell the people? Consecrate your lives, because for tomorrow we'll pass over. Set aside your heart, for tomorrow I'll show you great and mighty things that you know not of. And that's where we are as a congregation, folks. Get ready. Get ready. This is bigger than we ever imagined. Father, I bless you and thank you for these incredible people. We will bring them, Lord. We will bring them. In Jesus' name, amen. Men, see you tomorrow night. See the rest of you. Uh, prayer tomorrow morning, Friday morning, and Saturday night, and all the other good times we gather together. Oh, yeah, men having steak. Tomorrow night, every man gets a steak. Are you kidding me? Steak and potatoes. All right? We're going to get... Yeah.